Happy New Year, friends. Welcome to episode 23 of Connecting Through Conversation. I'm your host, Miranda Oakley. For this month's episode, I'm excited to welcome back singer, songwriter, and actress Ansley Hendricks to the podcast. If you missed our first conversation, definitely give that a listen. Welcome back, Ansley. Hi, I'm so glad to be back. It's great to have you again. You've had an album come out since we last spoke. Tell us about that, and then I'll tell you my favorite song. Okay, yeah. So I have an album available on Bandcamp. It's called Always Original, and it's basically a reflection of my life and how I don't want to be a carbon copy of anything or anyone, or I just want to be me, always original. So I just, I wrote it from my heart and from my soul. You know, that's the best. I feel like, you know, there should never be a carbon copy. Yeah. <laughs> I love everything, honestly, but one of my favorites is okay again. When I hear it, I think of faith and how God shows us the way. But what inspired you to write that one? Actually, it was faith. Yeah, it was definitely faith. I I, I just remember reflecting on how, you know, in the first verse, we always think, you know, hope. You know, where were you then? Where, where are you now? And we always think, you know, that it's just hope that gets us through things. Oh, I hope this will work. Hope that will but and then the second verse always you're there and sometimes I'm not and that's I think the hardest thing to grapple with because sometimes we're not there and he is and so God is always with us and sometimes I think it's hard for us to realize that we can be okay again if we rely on him and we rely on his word and uh, we rely on him to bring us up at our lowest. That is so true. I'm also a woman of uh, a woman of faith, as we've talked about before. And um, I think that we all have moments when, you know, we can hear God, but sometimes we'll be like, OK, like speak through, you know, the noise or maybe, you know, I need to know, like, you know, more of what you're telling me on this. So well said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows I'm a wicked music junkie and I always love hearing about the album process and attending writers rounds whenever I can. For those who don't know, writers' rounds are typically held at cafes. Musicians will share stories about songs they've written to go along with their performance, which are often acoustic. Their performances are often acoustic in these settings, and they're often they're played at smaller venues. So take us through your album process. How did you decide which songs made the final cut and which songs to leave in the vault, as they say? So I honestly felt like the al the tracks I chose for this album, I wanted to reflect me in the best light possible. Um, I felt like a lot of my songwriting in the beginning was just kind of uh, very vague, very general, and it didn't really, uh, the lyrics were not as fleshed out as uh, they are now. Um, and so I really just, I really just, when I was deciding on what tracks to put, uh, away, I just kind of thought which ones best describe me now and also have described me then but have a different reflection point and a, a different way of, of reflecting my journey and my story versus the ones from 2018 and 2019. Would you ever consider including unreleased songs, vault tracks as they're often called on a future album? Maybe on an EP. I don't know. <laughs> You'd probably be the only one that would, that would buy it. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, probably just in a very intimate setting, like an EP to where, you know, it probably wouldn't, you know, cost a lot of money just because I want to, you know, kind of test it out first and see if people would want a full length album. So yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of nay, you know, no and yes. And the thing, yeah. So maybe. Yeah, interesting. I have to say, um, so for the literal people of the world, um, <laughs> th th there's something called work tapes. Uh, they're not actual tapes, but it's just called that. Um, and so they, um, when artists will release work tapes, um, like acoustic versions of songs or, you know, rough demos, different mixes, I think sometimes those are the best. Um, I sometimes like those better oh. than what comes out. Yeah so yeah you 
You've had several gigs since we last spoke, one of them being performing at Mad Life Stage and Studios. I love small venues, so I've added Mad Life Stage and Studios to my list of venues I need to check out. <laughs> yes. It's awesome. Yeah, it just sounds so, so awesome. It's great. There's something great about each place you perform, but is there a gig you've done so far that stands out to you? I would have to say my gig at Mad Life. That was just such an amazing experience, and we'll talk about this later, but the stage is my home, and I feel like when I'm on stage and I'm connected with the audience and I'm responding to them, they're responding to me, there's just nothing like it, and that's what I felt. Um, and Mad Life is a smaller venue, so yeah, it is smaller, and so it's easy to be intimate and to connect with people, um, but just being in front of an audience is just... It, 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 there's just nothing like it. And so Mad Life was such a great start, especially um, to, you know, get my foot in the door of performing uh, pop music live and my original music live for um, a group of people. Where would you like to perform in the future? I would probably say Mad Life. It was just so, it was just so intimate and it was just so amazing. You know, it, there, it's one thing to perform in front of people, to perform in front of people who you don't know, who you feel like you've known forever when you're con up there singing your music and, you know, imagining that they can relate to you and you're relating to them through your music and then just hearing, hearing the reaction afterward. It's just, it's just so wonderful. You know, I have to say, I think if artists ever record live albums, which, you know, we know they do, yes. um, I feel like intimate small venues like that are perfect for stuff like that. Just because the acoustics are so good. I you don't get that from an I arena. Agree. Yeah, you don't get that from an arena or, you know, yeah. big stages like that. So I love small venues. Yeah. Yeah. You recently tried out for The Voice and American Idol, to name a few. Take us through preparing for auditions. Yeah. So um, the last time we spoke, um, a week after that, I finally found a voice teacher. I had been taking lessons, con you know, inconsistently, sort of on and off from different people, but I finally found my voice teacher in January of last year. Um, and she has just been the best, the most amazing uh, thing that's happened to me. Um, <laughs> um, and it, yeah, and so my audition process has definitely gone through her. I, I always go through her when I'm bouncing off ideas. And so I usually have two to three songs that I'll, you know, I'll, you know, borrow from. And then I'll sort of, you know, think about what is the connection I want to make with my audience? And then what, uh, what songs best reflect my voice? And so I'll usually narrow it down from three to two to one. And I'll usually just, you know, decide on which song best reflects me and which song best reflects my voice. And you recently tried out for America's Got Talent as well. Yes. Yes, and I ended up singing my original song, OK, again. And I feel like I'm trying not to get into this habit of singing original songs for auditions. But, uh, but both my voice teacher and I have said that uh, it's, it's a very different thing from singing a cover song. Because when you're singing your song, only you know know what it's about and only you can connect to it in your own way and so it's it, it's amazing how that works yeah and i think it's awesome you said you got it you had told me um off the podcast that you sang okay again um your original which is great and um oh. and and you you got a call back from idol which is awesome yes i did especially My for an original yeah, my second in seven years. It's um, it was absolutely amazing. Um, and I ended up not making it further, but just the experience of getting a call back, getting and getting to sing live for the executive producers was a very big deal and one I'll never forget. Yeah, that that's a great memory. I'm sure that's such a great experience. Yes. We'll talk about your acting later on, but while we're talking about auditions, I love your audition for A Christmas Carol. I'm certainly no expert, but I think it's really, really good. Yeah, everybody should check it out on Ansley's YouTube channel, which is Ansley Hendricks. A-N-S-L-E-Y-H-E-N-D-R-I-X. 
Thank you. And um, so do you want to talk about, a little about that audition that was yeah. I just thought your yeah I just thought your your you know with your monologue um your breath control was really good it was an <laughs> Alice in Wonderland monologue you can explain you know why that why you did oh. it that way. yeah yes yes and I know we're going to talk a little bit more about acting later but um but yeah yeah so I ended up choosing Alice in Wonderland because you're actually not supposed to perform from the show that they're doing so they want you to do something similar just because, you know, later in the callback process, they'll have you do it uh, from the show and they don't want to tire the material out. So they want you to do something similar to see if you can play a similar scope or range to a character. And so I ended up doing Alice in Wonderland um, and it was so much fun. You know, it was, you know, it was her down the rabbit hole monologue and it was all about how she's contemplating using her wild imagination childlike curiosity and wonder and it was just so much fun yeah to do those gasps and oh I shall hit the bottom and you know doing it really um all the gestures and like holding my arms out like I'm going down the rabbit hole it was just fun it was a really um playful and also co contemplative and it, I think it showed a variety of, of acting choices and it was a lot of fun yeah, I just I thought it was spectacular. I mean, uh, honestly, I'm you know, like I said, I'm I'm not an expert, but I really I just thought your breath control was amazing. You really could tell that you're putting yourself in Alice's head, and so um, great job. I I, I approve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I speak about inclusion on and off my podcast. Inclusion is important whether you have a disability or not. Growing up, I hung out with kids my age who accepted me. Aside from hanging out, sometimes they would help me through the lunch line or provide me with visual information from class that I missed because it is in print. It was in print. And so, um, you know, aside from a small few, peer-to-peer -peer interaction was frowned upon by adults at school. And as a result, I was separated from my friends. And so this is why when you told me how supportive your school was about peers helping you, I loved it. So tell me how they helped you. Oh my gosh. Well, first, I'm really sorry to hear that you were separated. That's, that's not good either. And that's definitely not a good way to, you know, because the point of being in school is also to, you know, make friends and to interact with, with other peers. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really sorry to hear about that. Um, but yeah, so the Peer Helper program was uh, basically a program where kids without disabilities could help those with. And so it was, um, it was really good because it was, it was also, you know, it wasn't just about the kids getting the experience, but also uh, I was able to make um, some friends from that program. And so it was, it was great because it was sort of a, peer to peer reaction peer to peer interaction as you said um and so it was uh they would help me through the lunch line just like they did with you um they would uh help me with my work if i needed it especially with math and science because math <laughs> and science were very uh visual and graph oriented and so um i, I really had to have help with those and so same hard yeah, stuff <laughs> yeah and so and so it was it was great to have because a lot of them were um a, a lot of them have remained really good friends and you know i still keep up with some of them and so that was it was just great you know to have that interaction with others and to um get that experience of uh interacting and also for them getting the experience of helping yeah, I think that, you know, supporting peer to peer interactions is something all schools should adopt because these interactions improve skills like social skills and advocacy skills, as well as critical thinking and communication skills, you know, like you were just talking about um, the student who's blind, as well as the students that are sighted, they have to figure out how they're going to communicate, how they, you know, need to ask for help, how they should be helping if someone's not being helped in a way that works for them, they need to speak up about that. And, you know, socially interacting, you know, you learn from seeing. And so when you can't see, you know, you really have to work on social skills. I feel like um, it's so, so important to help blind people with that. And, you know, kids are 
kids are great. I always say it's the adults that make things too complicated. But at the same time, you know, especially as you get older, I feel like kids can be kind of funny, you know, when you start getting into middle school and high school sometimes. And so it helps to, you know, teach kids that, hey, like we're normal, you know, we just Absolutely. do things a little bit differently. And that's OK, because guess what? You do something a little bit differently, too. And so, yeah. I, yeah. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, yeah, as I said, you know, um, I had, I, I used to um, have a friend and she'd sit next to me um, and she would tell me how to spell certain things sometimes or, you know, if I missed things from the board or whatnot. And, um, and I had a small group of friends that I hung out with. But uh, yeah, I've had a teacher, I came back to school one day and my desk was moved and we weren't allowed to sit together because she had said, you know, that if I'm asking how to spell certain things, uh, that must mean that said friend is doing my work for me. And I clearly, if I'm handing in work, that's good. I, I'm not that smart. So I'm, I, we have to be separated. And then they, then in, in my, you know, middle school, uh, they decided that the uh, one friend I was with him quite a bit, um, and these other two, uh, girls. And so they decided that because he and I were together so often, they came up with something so silly to say that, he actually depended on me too much. And so come eighth grade year, we were not on the same team anymore. And um, I just think it's wild. You know, I use these uh, not for pity, but just, you know, um, I've been someone who's been able to help. Uh, you know, I've been blessed and privileged to be a part of a conversation to make things better for the next generation of children, which is, you know, we always should uh, do our part in making sure that kids have it better than we did. And, um, and so that's why I talk about these things, you know, so people can learn from it because if it happened to me, it could happen to somebody else. And so, yeah, I, I just think that, you know, with sighted students, um, you know, if there's ever a clique of girls or, you know, a group of guys, nobody would say, oh, let's separate them because X, Y, or Z, you know, um, they don't do that, uh, but they do with, you know, they, they have with people with disabilities and, um, and so, that's why I talk about it. Yeah. So thanks for sharing. That's, that's a good story. And, uh, and I would also add that it starts with a question. Like all you have to do is ask, like it's, I think, I think the problem that we face um, with disability advocacy is people aren't afraid to ask questions and not just, uh, you know, how long have you been blind kind of questions like about the blindness, but also just about normal everyday things like how do you watch movies how do you you know just like things yeah. like that I feel like yeah so I, I totally get that and I'm so sorry to hear about um all of, all of that th stuff that happened to you that's just terrible yeah you know on, the, on on a positive note um I will say that I've I've read um you know recently in the last few years that they are starting to realize you know that funny thing like blind and sighted people can be friends and that when people are starting to become friends that they should you know reinforce those interactions and um celebrate milestones and so I'm you know uh it was unfortunate I I still have friends that can see um but you know uh I think that they um they've learned a lot we've come a long way and, and I'm just I'm I'm happy to have, have been a part of a conversation uh so that you know kids can have a better experience yeah so yeah absolutely. thanks for sharing you're yeah. welcome thank you for sharing that was yeah I, I, again i'm so sorry to hear about that and i hope yeah. things can be better yeah absolutely i know we we uh they, they are i just from s someone that i know um who's in a school system and thriving uh really awesome so great um but you know no matter what area it is there's always a lot of work to be done so absolutely yeah. And I have to say, like, the great thing about the friends that I had is that, you know, they stayed friends with me through um, uh, the school that I went to when I changed schools and left public school. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I think that I guess I just say all this to say that, like I said, if, if it happened to me, it could happen to someone. Um, and, uh, you know, as anything can. And I think um, that, you know, people have to realize that, like, I think sometimes schools often try to take, take, take from people, but in the end, you know, like education is something you can't take away. Obviously the friends that I grew up with, uh, some of them would come and visit me. And so, um, we always oh. found a way to get together, even though, you know, adults tried to separate us. So oh. yeah. Um, 
So let's Good shift gears a bit yeah. <laughs> and um, let's talk about acting. Tell us what you've been up to since we last spoke. Yeah, so I know I uh, we talked about a Christmas carol. I tried out for a Christmas carol. Unfortunately, I was not chosen, but it was such a great experience. Um, and I guess the next point that I wanted to make was, um, and I know we've talked about this off of the podcast, but so I'll be vulnerable here and share that um, before I found my voice teacher, I wasn't sure how much longer I would be singing or at least on this, you know, at least as a full time career. And so that really affected uh, my musical theater career, which is something that I have that I have always wanted to do ever since I was little. And I felt like was sort of taken away from me because of my limited vocal range and, you know, all this different stuff um, that I won't go into. <laughs> um, because I want to, you know, bring some positivity to light. But um, but I, yeah, and so that was very hard for me to grapple with. And so when I finally found my voice teacher, I realized that I can have this career. And um, so musical theater, I have been uh, really, really focusing a lot on, on that because um, so getting monologues together, really, really, really uh, taking dance classes and really, really working on my voice and really just, you know, getting everything prepared for whenever the next audition comes because you don't, you don't know when the next thing will be. And so you just have to always be on your toes and stay on your A-game. Yeah, you know, I have to say, obviously, it wasn't anything serious like a career, but I, I actually did theater in high school and it was so much fun. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. we got to, uh, my roommate was in it as well. And so... Um, <laughs> We would always like <laughs> when we would prepare for um, like plays, uh, performances that night, we would always act super silly and like just mm -hmm. rehearse in our room like by ourselves. There's nobody watching so we can, you know, be ridiculous and and like get a, get our nerves out of our system yeah. so that we, could, you know, yeah, it, it was uh, we awesome. could perform and, and like, get <laughs> everything great. out. Before it. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was pretty funny. <laughs> um, yeah. So. I asked you this question before last time we spoke um, and I always like to ask this question even when I have guests uh, come back on which thank you again this is awesome yeah, thank you. Um, yeah and I, I love asking this because I feel like as our lives change and as our you know situations um, you know as we go through situations uh, our perspective shifts um, you know, personally, professionally. And so uh, I feel like your answer could constantly evolve or stay the same, but I always like to give people the chance. So do you have any advice for anyone interested uh, in acting and, and singing who is blind, who is thinking about pursuing uh, music or, or acting? Yes, I would say first um, for acting in general, just whether you're doing musical theater, movies, TV, straight theater, it's really just about advocacy and really advocating for yourself and asking questions and also encouraging others to ask questions. And this is what I was talking about earlier about, you know, I feel that's just the problem is people don't ask questions. And so I feel like the way to get people to ask questions is to ask questions yourself. And so, Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so I feel like that that's a very big thing. And then also, so specifically, um, I have found the best thing that works for me is uh, tactile markings. So if you're doing choreography or if you're doing just plain uh, stage movement or uh, on camera blocking, you know, you really just want to, you know, know your mark, of course, know your point of, uh, you know, where your entrance and your exits are, but also um, allowing the, uh, allowing the directors to uh, work with you and and also getting, you know, getting those tactile markings, whether it be race tape, um, which is what I had someone do for me um, in a play in college. And it was, it was just amazing. And it was, it was just such a great uh, little handy nifty trick. Um, and basically, you know, you just put it on the edge of your mark. And so you'll know, okay, whether it's a edge of the stage or right in the camera line, you know, you know where that is. And, um, and also for things, that people think are unavoidable, like bumping into someone, like that's where 
you know, you can have someone stand next to you. And like, there's always a way to work around something. So like just having someone stand next to you to guide you if you do get out of line or having them make, you know, noises, tapping their leg or tongue noises to, yeah. And so things, little tricks like that is what I would say um, for the blind actor, um, because I think it's so important to advocate for yourself. And if they ask you, well, how can we work with you to really uh, research and also communicate with others who, um, who struggle because we all can learn from each other and we can all learn how to be better together. Yeah, thanks for explaining that. That's really interesting because I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you where you put your marking. Yes. So whether in music or acting, how can coaches be better about including musicians, actors, and actresses who can't see? So my next point, that's so funny because my next point was going to be talking about um, choreographers and, and directors and how they describe certain things and how they explain certain things. My best advice is just to be very specific, as specific as possible. Um, so instead of, you know, cross over here, cross over here <laughs> means cross to the left or to the right. Right. We don't know what that's over what here that, means. Yeah, it's we like, don't know what that means. So <laughs> some foreign say, land, right? To the left or to the right or yeah um when you're doing a piece of choreography one thing that can be a bit uh well in the kindest way possible a bit annoying is when you hear you know kickball change da 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 and it's like what does da 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 mean oh pot of array back side front you know things you know so it's just things like that you know be yeah. careful about saying certain things that you know everyone has their own language every director every choreographer has their own language but you know, when you're learning, you know, learn their language, but also teach them yours. And so, because we have our own languages too. And so, um, so yeah, just really communicate, communicate, communicate. Right. And, you know, that is so, I, I know that we, you know, talk on this podcast, but we're great friends, obviously, as, as well outside of the podcast. Um, yes. <laughs> but I, I, what you said is so true. I mean, even just as people, you know, we, we do speak our own language. And one of it reminded me, like one of my, one of my friends, she would be like, oh, do they speak the language of Miranda? Like when people know <laughs> us really well, it's like, oh, okay. Like you just know that somebody's going to appreciate something or mm, that might make, you know, maybe that might make her a little mad. Um, so yeah. <laughs> regardless, I think that's a, a, a good point. And, um, you know, I would always say, no matter what, I'm with you there, over there, over here, like, really is, like I said, it's like a foreign land, like, we don't know what the heck that means, you know, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so specific <laughs> is key, yes, specificity is key, yes, yeah, yes, yep, absolutely, well, thank you so much for talking with me again today, this thank has been so, it was so yeah great. it really was this was so much fun to catch up and to hear about all the cool things you're doing yeah. and yeah I'm I just I'm really looking forward to seeing where you're headed and um obviously have you back on again at some having you back on again at some point and absolutely so, yeah and so you can follow Ansley on Facebook she has a couple of pages at Ansley Hendricks actress Ansley Hendrix Music and Acting with Ans ANS. Um, Ansley, she also has a new Instagram page uh, at Ansley underscore Hendrix underscore actress singer. So go follow mm -hmm. her over there. And she is also on YouTube, as I mentioned, at Ansley Hendrix. Again, A N S L E Y H E N D R I X. And she's also, as well, she's also on Bandcamp at Ansley Hendrix. As she mentioned, her album is over there. So do all the things, go stream it, buy it, um, support it. And thank you all for listening. And until next time, be well. <laughs>